Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome to 1014, uh, 1014 Fifth Avenue. My name is Benjamin Bergner. I'm the program officer of the organization 1014 that runs uh, this space as a project space at the moment. This building, 1014, is, um, is in transition and transformation constantly, kind of. Built in 1907, it was a private home for a while. Um, then it was the home to an ambassador who used the space to have big parties and gatherings. It was then the German Cultural Institute from 1960. And Germany still owns it um, and uh, lets us use it to have these wonderful um, events here that bring people together. That is like a space, a platform for exchange, for dialogue and for yeah, really thinking about solutions for the future. The building will be renovated kind of soonish. You can see some of the paint is peeling off. Um, and the renovation, um, the architects for it, um, or it has been commissioned um, and given to David Chipperfield Architects in London together with the um, offices here, Caro Architects and the Paratus Group, who will turn this into this modern hub to um, host fellows from around the world and cultural events, dis discussions, and also workshops. We're hoping for this to start towards the end of next year. I'm honored tonight to partner with the Columbia Graduate School for Architecture, Planning and Preservation with their Natural Materials Lab um, and with the Architectural League of New York. Thank you to all of our partners. Thank you to my team, um, but also thank you for, uh, to the students who put together this wonderful exhibition um, led by Professor Lola Ben-Alon, who is really the force behind this program tonight, um, and also the exhibition. Thank you so much for that collaboration. I do want to say that both um, the Architectural League as well as 1014 are nonprofit organizations that do depend on, on your donations to run these programs. We appreciate your financial contributions to our programs tonight and um, the other programs that we do. So I do want to wish all of us a wonderful evening here um, at 1014 tonight, and I am going to hand over the microphone to Rosalie Genevro, the Executive Director at the Architectural League of New York. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody, um, and welcome on behalf of the Architectural League um, to what I am sure is going to be a fascinating and eye-opening series of presentations and discussion. We are really grateful to um, Benjamin and Katja and 1014 for being such a gracious host and including us in um, tonight's event, and to Lola and the Natural Materials Lab for being willing to share their research in this evening's program with us. For the League, this event is part of a series that began this spring um, and will extend into the fall called From Field to Form on Biogenic and Geogenic Materials. The purpose of this series is to look at natural materials and their potential to make possible not only a more deeply environmentally conscious and benign architecture, but also new ways of conceiving architectural form. The first two programs in the series are available as videos on the League's website, archleague.org, and I think you'll find them very worth your time. That we need intensive research and invention in this arena is increasingly evident for all kinds of reasons. At this point, year by year, if not month by month, we're ever more technologically capable of reducing the role of fossil fuels and thus climate change impacts in the operation of buildings. That, of course, changes the relative importance of embodied energy in the overall calculus of building impacts. The greenhouse gas generating inputs that go into the production and transportation of materials becomes ever more important. But there are other reasons as well to be much more attentive to the composition, provenance, and multiple environmental impacts of materials. They have, material choices have consequences. The complex life histories need to be followed back to their impacts on workers and ecosystems involved in their production, the impacts of their transport and distribution, their effects on building users, and their life as waste products after building demolition. Research, invention, experimentation, and not infrequently the rediscovery of earlier ways of doing things that I suspect we will hear a little bit about tonight. To find better approaches is crucial to make con construction less energy intensive and healthier. 
From Field to Form started with a program catalyzed by a new book by LTL Architects called The Manual of Biogenic House Section. And that program included a presentation by Lola Benalone about her work with the Natural Materials Lab. So we're delighted to be here tonight for a more in-depth look at the work of the lab and to learn about the research and work of our, of our other speakers. By way of very brief introduction of Lola, um, she directs the Natural Materials Lab and the Building Tech Curriculum at Columbia GSAP, where she's Assistant Professor of Architecture. She specializes in socially and environmentally sustainable bu building materials, construction practices, and engineering architecture collaborations. She received her PhD in architecture at Carnegie Mellon University and holds a bachelor's degree in stru structural engineering and a master's in construction management from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. And now I'll hand it over to Lola. Thank you, Rosalie. Thank you, thank you, Rosalie. Thank you, Benjamin, and thank you, um, uh, for the 1014 team, Benjamin, Katya, and uh, everyone, and for the, uh, for the Architecture League of New York for all your collaboration and wonderful work together. Um, and thank you for, for arriving. Uh, thank you for all the participants and thank you for the students. Um, and today I wanna start with um, a brief introduction to frame our discussion because matter, whether it's a rock formation or clay soil um, is not fixed in time or space. Energy of many processes are embedded or embodied in materials. Energy is what binds matter, what activates matter, what transforms matter, and what organizes matter. And in fact, all materials in architecture are initially earthen. The geological trade routes of building materials dictate their earthly origins using strata, rocks, metals, minerals, chemicals, enzymes, bacteria, but also politics, labor, human hands, and tools. So in that sense, couldn't we classify all buildings as quote-unquote earthen? And I'm smiling because we have a lot of debate about that. Um, so what do we actually mean when we say earth or earthen construction? To answer this question and to frame the materiality discussion, I invite us to look back at the work of Howard Autumn that was... I, um, was introduced to me by Tommy, who will speak today. And um, Howard Autumn is an ecologist uh, and system theorist who developed the theory of energy, uh, which means the available cosmic energy used directly and indirectly to produce elements through sun, gravity, environmental forces. Um, and this di diagram by Baruch Gottlieb from Disinnovation, um, a French collective of artists and curators is here translating Adam's model into a diagram for industrial on the left versus uh, geo and biogenic production on the right. So earth materials suggest transformations that are reversible by being in account with vapor and water. And as opposed to refined materials like cement and petroleum, natural and earth-based materials are defined as permeable, as raw, minimally processed and meshed in extensive labor rather than embodied energy flows. So the raw constituent materials in earth construction will usually include sand from the, um, this within the soil for compressive strength, fibers for the tensile strength, additives like dung for, as a plasticizer, and then the clay within the soil is the magical binder. And using these four constituent materials, one can formulate a range of techniques, styles, and thermal possibilities from light, straight, uh, light straw clay, which is an insulative uh, um, um, infill that is tamped within a structural frame to cob that is manually sculpted um, and is a load-bearing mass wall. And each mixed design in earth construction is adapted to the specific technique, rammed, weaved, molded, cast, sculpted, 3D printed, modularly pressed, or sprayed, which you can hear um, today uh, from our uh, speakers. Um, so creating the mixed design, that's where the magic happens. Through hands-on and field investigations and sensorial experiences, uh, that are present, by the way, even in ASTM standards for earth construction, which is um, a nice thing to see. You learn how to assess mixed designs and also develop new recipes. Very similar to cooking, 
uh, where each ingredient has its role in the chemical reaction, in the mixture for taste, for texture, to make a high performance cookie, if we can tell, say something like that. So does the work with earth materials and natural materials is much about finding optimal mixed designs. And at the Natural Materials Lab at Columbia GSAP, we use mixed design experimentation to characterize and test the fresh and dry state properties in terms of rheological, thermal, structural, and durability capabilities. And in this case, um, oops, here, for 3D printed earth that maximizes fiber content and become paper light. Um, or in this example, obtaining different fiber uh, compositions to create lightweight, radiant, heated structures for a localized heating environment in a chase. And we called this prototype Jandag, or body in our make, since it uses a body made of bamboo skeleton, a light straw clay tissue, a clay skin, and a flaxseed oil protective sealant, like our natural skin oils. And inside, we passed radiant heat vanes that pump heat and energy into the chair, um, as you can see in these thermal imaging. And the model sitting on it mentioned it was like sitting on a piece of land warmed by the sun, which was um, kind of what it was. In another project, we used earth as a wearable substance, creating thin earth skins that lend themselves to sculptural shape or sculpted directly onto one's body. Working with earth is exactly what um, I wanted to do, uh, being immersed where, um, the, to wear the mud. Um, we realized that wearable substances require flexibility. What do we do then? How do we make soil flexible? So we combine the mud with fibers and kitchen substances like starch and agar and glycerine to create a wearable soil. And Penmai there is the research assistant for this project. Um, that soil then can be stitched, laser cut, or embroidered. In this other project, we be began with an investigation into the symbolism and patterns in the Noche de Paño dress, transferred by um, ancestry, my ancestry in Moroccan Sephardic tradition, and continued with a study into the Arab Mashrubiya typology, asking, can we reinterpret vernacular building components embedded with ancient knowledge on passive systems, but with the lightness typical of fabric construction. So um, our work started with design of spatial lines in a line-based deposited order from a line tectonics to a mashrabiya pattern and from heavy mass to lightweight mesh. Um, what does it mean to construct earth with lines? The fibers become an agent for a self-supporting geometry. And the final installation that you can see on the first floor um, in the space mimic the movement of a fabric, but also offering a lightweight, lightweight interplay with light and shadow. And I'm thankful for Olga um, and Tasha, um, the researchers, for their heavy lifting of a lightweight material, but still a lot of heavy lifting. Um, and a few words about the Making with Earth exhibition that you can see here. Um, in the space, so students have worked really extensively in teams to produce and create an immense body of research on earth construction, starting from mixed designs to um, the experimental setup. They reuse, for instance, shopping bags that were proven a perfect known woven fabric for cast earth. They experimented with the possibility of using loofah as a formwork for a cob developed yards long of translucent earthen fabrics using structural weaved fibers, agar and gelatin, and speculated about ornamentation with imperfect 3D printing, and what does it mean to bring mud into a white gallery space. In the final class installation, teams um, regrouped together to produce a ram block wall, a collective installation, while managing all the curatorial aspects. So if you go to the space, everything in the space is made by students, from the pedestals to the text labels, to the video art, um, and of course the history. So I'm extremely proud of you, um, all of you students, Priscilla, Will, Team, Paul, um, Armita, Neil, Zufei, Justin, Weiwei, Yifei, Chan, Clara, Zishia, Ranshin, Wenjing, Jackie, Sichuan, Yvonne, Liz, Daniel, Shiyu, and Yuli. 
and Khadija, the amazing TA, if you're here, just like such an amazing, incredible, a lot of work. As a last note, um, earth construction is not without limitations. It's perceived as low tech and dirty. Sometimes it is dirty. Um, the map shows here a section of a global perception survey we um, depicted of experts repeatedly mentioned this um, strong perceptual barrier. But there's also a lot we need to do with overcoming durability uh, and maintenance challenges. How do we use appropriate design with a good pair of boots and a nice uh, umbrella, right, that the proof hang to um, reduce rain-driven and uh, water erosion? What about the questions of scale? How do we use earth in high rise? Do we use it in finished materials and interior panels? What about um, structural compressed blocks? Um, and you can really see beautiful examples emerging in the last decade, especially in Germany where great earth and building codes exist. And with this, I want to finish and hand over the stage to our amazing speakers. So Lisa is an engineer an architectural designer who owns and operates Colorado Earth, a company that produces Adobe and Earth blocks. She's the author of Adobe Homes for All Climates and an advocate for natural building materials. Uh, join me in welcoming Lisa. Okay, thank you, Lila. Lila's been a, a good friend of mine. Um, we met at uh, Earth USA, a conference held in in, uh, San in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and a few of us mudheads. Um, several of us here get together. So it's uh, great to be here in New York City and talking about um, my experience uh, now in, in Colorado. So I wanted to talk about, uh, Lilla touched on some of the perceptions and, and how we, and why we need some of these new imperatives for this, this lovely historical um, way of building that we have done for thousands of years and why we still need it today. So again, I'm a, I'm a, a professional engineer and architectural designer. I learned this trade while living in New Zealand. I um, moved to a little island called Waiheke and uh, learned about mud bricks down under and kind of have brought this trade back uh, now to Colorado. So um, I'm set up right by a quarry and uh, they mine aggregate and and um, and rock, and they basically chuck the stuff back in the hole, or uh, they send it to my to my facility, which is positioned nearby. And it's a sandy clay ratio in the kind of the right proportion that I need it for block making. Um, I do I have a background in Adobe, but now I've um, looking to scale, and so that's where the compressed earth blocks come in. Higher production rates, higher strengths, a little bit better in public perception as well, because it looks more like a tra traditional brick. Um, I'm in a cold climate, and so I have to. Um, there's an energy code I have to comply with, as well as you know all the engineering um, restrictions. So I'm building a double wall, and here it's structural. So if there's no need for any other framing or structural elements, there's a cavity there of three inches that I fill with um, with perlite or cellulose as an insulation, um, looking to to kind of disrupt the energy code with um, some other. Uh, thermal um, resistance kind of performance in the in that cavity, but right now it's an insulation material. And uh, here you can see that cavity being filled at the top, and then I'll have a bond beam that which is kind of holding it all structurally together. Um, you know why a big motivator for me why I'm doing this is that uh, we're we live in a fire fire um, you know issues here in Colorado. We just had a Marshall fire in Boulder County and about a thousand people lost their homes. So I'm actually currently doing some rebuilding efforts and um, really happy to be providing a material that is uh, not framed that will hopefully keep them safer uh, if and should this happen again. So this is uh, one of my clients and they're um, big advocates of, of uh, rebuilding their home this way. And you know, as as fires are certainly on the rise, we are seeing that. Um, we've talked about embodied energy and the importance, not just, not just the operational energy, what it takes to heat and cool a building, but also what is that building material made from and how much energy did it take to create that. So currently conducting a life cycle assessment on the production of the blocks in Colorado. And um, for that reason, have actually switched to a lime stabilized material and keeping my, my options open actually for um, innovative materials um, 
specifically looking right now at mine tailings. Supply chain, uh, my vision is to have these, these facilities set up in locations where there is suitable material so we can have this greater access accessibility so I'm not shipping you blocks here from uh, Colorado. And uh, of course, longevity and human health. There's uh, increasing people that come to me that have uh, mold issues or um, where their buildings are um, not keeping them in a healthy state. So this is one of the areas we can address. And of course, um, some of the benefits, you know, uh, bulletproof might not be a, an issue uh, for all people, but the, the Army and uh, U.S. Uh, Navy have looked at that aspect for um, for their purposes also. So um, perceived negatives that uh, we want to you know understand that, as Lola mentioned, there is a perceived negative. There's people that historically have built this way. They're looking to advance and build a more modern um, and mo more modern production. Um, however. You know, I think the fact that um, you might have your own public perceptions, your, your own perceptions too of this material and certainly seen in a gallery casts it in a different light. But um, these are some of the perceived negatives. You know, we have the engineering, uh, we have uh, people who are um, making these making these materials, seeking this material, and um, it has its li limitations of how tall you can go. And, um, you know, as a low rise building, there's certainly um, application for this. So how do we think about moving uh, this material into the mainstream or into where um, people can have access to it? It's a great article here written about how Adobe is not poverty, it's actually resilience. And I think with this whole uh, motion and movement that we're seeing here today um, in our day today that we just do need to look at climate change and climate resiliency as um, as a way to address the concerns that are amongst us. And so this is some um, one example of you know, earth and masonry at scale. This is a, 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 sing, a multifamily home in San Antonio. They did a fireproof uh, testing for this for the structure, built a wall, had a fire against it for about eight hours until everyone was ready to go home. And the blocks uh, just turned to a, a ceramic finish. I have one of the blocks from that. So about the quarter inch of the face uh, turned to a fired brick. Um, some of you guys might be practitioners in this um, in this room, and you know, looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If I were to try, many many um, words could be placed in these boxes. But I think, what are some of the what are some of the things we're trying to achieve? What is the what are some of the problems that are out there, and what are the solutions? And I think it's it's um, helpful for us to think about that there are different solutions to address different problems. This was uh, published, some of us have seen this and it's good to share, but this was published, uh, 40 Things You Need to Know in the Next 40 Years. And um, it happened to be the, um, top of the list on that article, Sophisticated Buildings Will Be Made of Mud. And I think it's a great uh, reminder to us that this is a material that we actually need to, to, um, to bring in, like this one here shown in Rwanda. This is actually a, a vault made of earthen, earthen bricks. So I have... Um, done well to make it within my time frame, and I think that I will now pass it back to Lola. Thank you. And by the way, the block installation in the exhibition is made with recycled blocks from Colorado Earth that we used for a mock and then reused it. So the reversible metamorphosis of earth materials. Um, I'm delighted to invite um, to the stage Ronald Rael, who's a designer, activist, architect, and author whose research interests connect indigenous and traditional material practices to contemporary technologies and issues. He is the Eva Lee Memorial Chair in Architecture at the University of California, Berkeley, and the chair of Berkeley's Department of Art Practice. He directs the Print Farm Laboratory, which stands for, for print facility for architecture, research, and materials, and is the author of Earth Architecture, a history of building with Earth in the modern era. Thank you. Thank you. So as Lisa mentioned, on the 40th anniversary of the Smithsonian, the 40 things you need to know about the next 40 years are sophisticated buildings are going to be made out of mud. And what I think is great about that is that 
the thing you need to know, the number one thing you know, need to know about the last 10,000 years is that sophisticated buildings were made out of mud. Civilization said that. Um, I have been working on the project of earth and architecture for my entire life, and my family has been for maybe thousands of years. Um, I ran a website for a couple of decades called Earth Architecture, which ultimately became a book called Earth Architecture, that looked at the collision between earth and modernity. And there is a modern history of building in earth. Frank Lloyd Wright, Loos, uh, uh, Gaudi, all of the moderns in architecture built with earth. And that was very interesting to me. And I was also interested about what is the future of Earth. Uh, in the present, we see that that collision of modernity and tradition came together in violent ways, ridiculous ways, really interesting ways. And I've always been fascinated about these morphological transformations that have taken place on buildings that are thousands of years old and what happens when modernity encroaches upon them and how do they transform and change and become new languages and new typologies. I've done this in my own practice with traditional building materials. I've, my studio built the, probably the first adobe house in Marfa, Texas in 100 years, a house we call the Box Box House, which is entirely made out of mud bricks from both New Mexico and Mexico. So there's like an archeological record built into this house of where the bricks came from and was their economy. And it's interesting to think about how earth it, and buildings made of earth can become cultural objects as they always have been. And Prada Marfa is an example of a building that we worked on with the artist Elm Green and Drag set that is actually made of adobe, thinking about that juxtaposition between wealth and poverty, between tradition and modernity and what that means. I spend a lot of time in my own community working on buildings made out of earth and practicing and teaching traditional earthen construction technologies using uh, buildings within the community that are present on the border of Southern Colorado and Northern New Mexico. I teach plastering methods, brick making methods, and I work with the community and my own community to not only celebrate this tradition, but also envision new structures for that community. And for the last 15 years, my own community is making 40,000 mud bricks to build this enormous labyrinth made out of adobe uh, there in Colorado that um, they will use for uh, spiritual and, and internal uh, reflection. So many of these buildings have really interesting histories, really traumatic histories and fraud histories. This was a former Indian agency that's actually right across the road from that labyrinth. And to think about how we can unearth those histories and tell the stories of those histories that are present in that landscape and expose them. And so this is a project about that Ute Indian Agency and the histories that are untold and we're retelling within that building. I also teach traditional cooking technologies that come from this technology of mud. It's a cooking technology, these are called ornos, it just means ovens, but they migrated to the Americas 400 years ago, and we still use them today, to think about how we can use earth as a material for coming together. Because for me and for many others, earth is more than a material, it's a cultural practice. And I do this in traditional ways and weird ways. I'm working with the American Refugee Committee to think about how we can deploy these ovens and refugee shelters using these inflatable uh, formwork that we just pack mud around to, and we test these ideas of traditional ways of making and uh, experimental ways of making. But I'm also interested in the collisions between uh, technology and Earth. And I've spent a lot of time in the last decade developing software technologies for 3D printing raw clay, uh, using local soils along the US-Mexico border. And these have resulted in large-scale architectural experiments to think about how we might be making these sophisticated buildings of the future. This project, I give a lot of credit to uh, COVID, we call it Casa Covida, but it's an experiment that, that allowed me to test large-scale 3D printing technologies using raw earth. Um, I always think that looks like a cherry on top of a chocolate sundae. And more, most recently this summer, I printed what may be the first raw earth 3D printed, per permitted and engineered structure in the world. It's, some, it's a project I call Skylos, because in this landscape, there are silos everywhere. And we wanted to make a silo that holds the sky. 
So here's an example of what that process looks like of 3D printing Earth. The Earth comes from near the site. We're mixing it, turning it into a mud. And the robot is simply depositing that material. So you can see the pump in the center. And everybody asks me why I do circles, because it's the biggest thing I can print right now, at least this summer. So um, these are a series of silos, as I mentioned, to look at this dark sky environment and frame the skies and see the stars and the skies. And this project isn't completed yet, but it'll have a series of bathing pools in each of these um, sky lows to observe the dark skies. And finally, just three weeks ago, I've been able to scale up. I've been working on this project for over a year now, the mounting of a large scale automobile automotive construction robot on the back of a 27 foot long trailer to extend the possibilities of thinking about mobility, about technology, and thinking about the marriage of the future and the past to think about how we make buildings that are reflective of both times and places. So thank you. Thank you, Ronald. I'm inviting Tommy Shaper Cotter, who's an architect, builder, and educator devoted to transdisciplinarity, uh, transdisciplinary exploration of material cultures, construction ecologies, and interdependencies between built and non-built environments. He's an adjunct assistant professor in the Irvin S. Uh, Shannon School of Architecture at Cooper Union, and he is also. Um, and um, he also teaches at Columbia University, GSAP, a course called uh, Con uh, Construction Ecologies in the Anthropocene. Uh, great, thanks everyone for coming. I'm super excited to be here tonight. Um, my talk for tonight is called Earth Rising and you're gonna kick out of this first slide. Um, I'm gonna start with something you've <laughs> heard about a couple times already, but I brought the artwork. <laughs> um, uh, and so you've already heard about this, but uh, here's, here's the artwork. And I'm going to actually run you through some of the other claims that were made on this list to contextualize. Um, so this list that came out in 2010, it, uh, it had some optimistic statements on it, like uh, number 25, artists will run the world. I think this is a safe space to say that's optimistic. Uh, it also had rather pessimistic ones, like number eight, it's curtains for the world's rarest dolphin. And ones like number six, uh, oysters will save wolves from climate change, uh, that make you read it a second time to see if you saw it correctly. Um, but as you all know already, number one on this list was sophisticated buildings will be made of mud. And like my colleagues, I like to present this because this to me isn't an audacious claim, but an obvious one, of course, as both Lisa and Ron have, have already shared with you. Of course, right, we've been building with sophisticated buildings with mud for millennia um, all over the world. In fact, in many cases, those uh, buildings predating the countries in which they're now located. Um, and many scholars have uh, articulated how mud has been entwined with who we are and how we build for thousands of years. Uh, Shannon Mattern in her book, Code and Clay, Data and Dirt, writes, mud and its material analogs, clay, stone, brick, concrete, have supplied the foundations for our human settlements in forms of symbolic communication and have bound together our media, urban, architectural, and environmental histories. Uh, and there are many resources, publications today by uh, builders and designers whose primary medium is earth. I've been lucky to study with and work with the two represented here, Martin Rao and Anna Herringer. Uh, I had the opportunity to study with Anna in Bangladesh and Austria during graduate school. And I also had an opportunity to work with Martin Rao in Austria. Both of them have been great mentors to me. Uh, Martin Rao's company, Lemton Erde, is one of the most prolific groups of builders and designers. Uh, uh, working with raw earthing construction in the world, um, particularly with their off-site fabrication methodologies, which you, you can see documented here. Um, but this, this, these methods of design and construction are seldom taught in the United States. So as I'm equally interested in working through them, I'm, I'm also very passionate about teaching them because I think we need to be passing these traditions on to the next generation of designers and builders. So last year, uh, I invited two of my friends from Martin's office, uh, Sammy and Lawrence, to come to the US and teach this workshop with me and Lola. And I'm just gonna take you through some of that, uh, some of that, the process of construction for this installation. Uh, 
So we were invited to build this at the Columbia Climate School at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is uh, located about 15 miles north of Manhattan on the Hudson in Palisades, New York. And we were invited to do it as part of an, uh, part of an Arts on Grounds initiative uh, for the school. There's the site plan of the campus. And we were asked to do it right here in the center, um, right in front of the geoscience building next to the bus stop. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention just how amazing the people and the facilities are at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. If you get the chance to go, I highly recommend it. Uh, in the geoscience building, for instance, they've been over decades collecting one of the largest uh, collections of deep sea sediment cores from all over the world. Um, and so we thought there was something very poetic about that, that we were talking about building with layers of earth and just beneath our feet, just beneath where our project would be located, is this repository of over 20,000 samples of deep sea sediment cores. And we thought that was something great about that. Um, but we wanted to be uh, similarly fastidious in, in our collection of data and uh, documenting our construction process, which began with exploring the soils and aggregates nearby. And so we wanted to respond to this great prompt by Jane Hutton, who in her book, Reciprocal Landscapes, writes, what if we saw construction materials not as fixed things, but rather as physical continuities of matter connected to land and people? What if, like x-ray vision, we could see materials beyond their commodity status as things that have values far greater and more complex than their market price? What if we saw urban development not as a story of human ingenuity on a green backdrop, but instead as a co-production with other species, materials, and distant landscapes? So this right here is our response to that, trying to track everything that was contributing to and affected by our installation. Um, most of the, almost 90% of the mass was salvaged, uh, recycled from a construction site in Warwick, New York, uh, about 50 miles away. And so we worked with the same excavation crew to bring that soil and aggregate from the construction site to our project. And there you can see uh, just how much love on the right there went into the making of our mixture. And you've heard a bit about that already. It's very important to talk about the mixture of earth, right? Many contemporary buildings today are built with, uh, as you've heard today, called, uh, stabilized earth, um, which there are many ways to do it, but typically involves putting cement uh, into, into the mixture. Um, whereas we chose to work with raw earth um, for many reasons. Um, mostly because it preserves the material's recyclability and hygroscopy, and of course, and fewer embodied carbon emissions. And you know, not only is this important for climate change, but it's also particularly relevant, I think, in an industry where we're very concerned about preventing buildings from burning down, but comparatively quiet about our tendency to burn buildings up. And here's us mixing the soil on site making test blocks. We did a design charrette with the students and came up with these two walls, which I started lovingly referring to as earthbergs. And so the final design is these two walls, one which aligns with the building, one which aligns with the walkway, and that reach out for one another in a, in a kind of tentative embrace to make this semi-private uh, sitting space. We built a, a foundation of mostly dry stacked stones with a little bit of mortar assembled formwork, created an assembly line because we had to in order to meet our construction schedule, and pneumatically rammed the material. Some of the builders are actually in the, in the crowd, so I'm glad to see some familiar faces. Uh, removed the formwork on the penultimate day, and the students got to learn, therefore, about retouching and maintenance and repair, processes that are also facilitated by using raw earth. Installed ring beams, the only other piece uh, with mortar in it. And there's the final installation from the, from the air. By the way, the, the little one is named Bob and the big one is named Maria. We named them. There's the final installation and some details up close. And the last thing I wanna talk about is these layers of, of white that you see here. Um, so those are lime checks made from lime and sand, uh, which represent a construction principle called, called, cal called calculated erosion, developed by, by Martin Rao. Um, and what happens is over time, the, as the fine clay particles from the face wash out, uh, the increasingly rougher surface of the, of the exposed aggregate and the wall will slow the velocity of water and therefore stall the erosion. So it's using design and geometry to, to stall the erosion of raw earth.
Um, as Anna Herringer and Martin Rowe and Lindsay Blair Howe write in their book, Upscaling Earth, Earth is water soluble, indeed making it vulnerable to weathering and environmental conditions. However, this fact is also an astonishing resource. Instead of trying to artificially compensate for this deterioration, rain earth construction should follow the principle of calculated erosion. And we're monitoring this now on the site. And I just wanted to credit everybody who worked on this because you know earth construction is one of those things that really truly reveals the importance of community. And I, I didn't have a photo of everybody. Um, and I just wanna end uh, with this photo, the way I began by zooming out, um, this is of course, as many if not most of you know, a very famous image uh, known by its popular name, Earthrise. It was taken on December 24th, 1968 in lunar orbit by the crew of, of Apollo 8. Um, and it's been credited by some as one of the most environmental photographs ever taken. Um, and in 2018 for the, I think we forget just how powerful it was at the time, but in 2018, Bill Anders, the astronaut who snapped the photo, uh, wrote a, a piece in which he said, we set out to discover the moon and instead we discovered the earth. And I think that's really beautiful and really powerful because it reminds us that in this, in this world we live in, in this profession we work in, I think we often cling to uh, Promethean promises of technological solutions for expediency and efficiency. But we often forget, I think, that sometimes great clarity can be found by just simply looking at something anew, something that's as quotidian as the soil itself, that we think we know already, but maybe we don't fully understand or appreciate. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Tommy. I'm delighted to uh, invite Lynette Weider, um, who's an architect, um, architectural historian, and educator, whose work currently focuses on low carbon renovations of modernist buildings, and a grant from the US Army Corps of Engineers to develop textile reinforced raw earth structures for, this, for the Sahel region. She's an associate professor of practice in sustainability management at Columbia University. Thank you. Thank you, Lola. Thanks to everyone for setting me up so well. I don't have to show my Smithsonian slide now. I didn't have a Smithsonian slide. Um, so I come to this in a slightly different way. I'm going to sort of walk you through three different instances in which I, in my various permutations, have come into contact with raw earth buildings, some more expected. And the, la the, la the last one, I think, the least expected and perhaps also a gesture to our host here and the, 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 the German roots of the organization. So um, uh, my first encounter with um, raw earth construction was when I was up at Rhode Island School of Design. I was department head there. And one of my colleagues came to me and said, I want to take 15 students to Mexico for six weeks and redesign a structure for a not-for-profit that's trying to house people. And at the same time, we're going to teach them how to build. And I said, sure, Sylvia, go for it. And she did it. So this was the community in which they were living um, because of the way the Mexican constitution is written. People have the right to land. And people were essentially living this way on their own land. Casita Linda, which was the organization, was building these concrete structures that people were using as lock boxes for their valuables, but not living in them because they were completely inappropriate to the climate. The students came up with, after studying with like local fabricators, local makers, this single one-room house with a vaulted roof that could be built in compressed earth block and the compressed earth blocks were um, locally sourced. And this is one of the construction images. Um, the side arches were structurally important, but also an opportunity for an outdoor kitchen. The vault became a sleeping space and the family for whom this was built who participated in the construction became um, to continue to work as fabricators in this in this construction technique. Um, 
I was super excited about it, and then I was thrilled. My, um, my family business is in the textile industry. My sister has followed in that. She has a small business called Noble Textiles, and with her, we applied and got money for a grant from the Army Corps of Engineers to look at earth construction as a replicable, standardized technology that could be used in the Sahel region. Um, in the service of the US Army, which loses more personnel to the transportation of materials and fuel than it does to actual combat every year. So the idea was to do this to alleviate the footprint of the Army, but also to do it to leave something behind that would actually finally be a gesture to the people in the region. Um, we went through a bunch of sketches. The idea was to use textile pieces both as templating and as reinforcing in the mortar, uh, to post tension using textile straps. We came up with a bunch of different ideas. There was a sort of form finding process, thinking about the possibility of textile for ring beam um, formwork. Uh, we had a good collaboration with uh, a lab up at Syracuse University that did all of our stress tests, and lo and behold, textile reinforcing actually greatly reduced fracturing. One of the reasons that adobe is not so desirable is because of loss of life under extreme conditions, such things as earthquakes. And this looked as though it could be quite, quite plausible. The other aspect of the project was uh, with a colleague up at Lamont uh, using um, a matching uh, algorithm between known soil types and mixes and what kind of adobe construction would be locally uh, responsive to climate and to um, soil quality. So th these were all sort of um, uh, engineered um, opportunities that I guess if your mind is prepared, find you. The last bit I'm going to talk about was completely unexpected. As an architectural historian, I work on post-war Germany. And I was in a bunch of archives last winter looking specifically at the period between 1945 and 1949. I knew very well that rubble building was before the currency reform and before the economy changed the only way in which rebuilding could continue. Um, I knew about Fritz Leonhardt, who was a bridge builder. I knew about his patents. And because of those patents, I went to an archive in Karlsruhe. Um, I also knew that Otto Bartning, who was an important um, church builder of the era, had done self-help buildings with refugees as they crossed Germany, uh, teaching them how to build for themselves in rammed earth. And this is one of those examples. I should have taken the check this out of the date. The date is correct. Um, but the big surprise was in the Kazwa archive was Egon Eiermann. For those of you who know who he is, he's known for uh, technological building, for curtain wall, et cetera. He is not known for, um, for, for rammed earth at all. In fact, he was very important for steel building. This is the German pavilion of 1958. You can see the expression is very indebted to a, a sort of standard modernist trope. Um, but his first buildings after the war in 1946 were for the German Caritas, which was a Catholic organization in a place called Hettingen. And he, these are some examples of the, uh, the, the site plan. You can see a sort of repetitive um, uh, unit design, very similar to a German tradition before the war. This is a letter in which he's conveying his interest in doing the project. And these are, this is a drawing of the facade. So what you have is Egon Eiermann and his, his partner, um, Robert Hilgers, designing in a modernist idiom using the material at hand, which was earth block. And they got a local brickwork to make the blocks for them, and they got local labor to build. What's really stunning is when you see the imagery of it, because it has a sort of level of refinement and perfection that registers a machined uh, desire, the, the sort of, you know, the 
many of the modernist idioms. The plans are also fascinating. Um, there's, you know, this functional separation on the left between common rooms, on the right, uh, the sleeping rooms. And um, because I'm particularly in love with detailing, uh, Robert Hilger do, drew all of the details for windows, furniture, um, shutters, etc., and you can see how they're pieced together because nails were not readily available. The question is, of course, who was building these windows? And if you think about the margin of error in earth construction versus the precision required here and the interface between the two, it becomes even more interesting. And I'll, I'll leave you with this image, which I love particularly because it's kind of idle after the war, right? Like a, a moment of domestic happiness in these earth buildings that incidentally Ironman refused ever to publish for the very reasons that have been talked about. But, Anyway, I will leave it at that, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Lina. Should we? I think what's really astonishing about the short um, series of talks today is really the really um, immense or variability of perspectives from um, design to production to build, from pragmatism to futurism to the historical and archival work. Um, and I think the, this broad array of, of perspectives is, is really important when speaking about um, a material, when, when looking at material from different um, views. And in a sense, another thing I, I wanted to raise is that in each of your presentations, there was a, a notion of um, looking at um, the low tech of, of Earth, um, either speculating about it or responding to it. But low tech, uh, when I say low tech, I'm, I don't mean subgraded technology, but a simple solution that performs in complex ways, um, right? With the, the lime checks, or even with the actual apl applying pressure to the block as a, as a quote unquote low tech solution. Um, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts about um, how low tech in earth um, contributes not only to the environmental agency of the material, but also to the political agency, how it contributes to um, maintaining the link with the human hands and the material um, and where this is all going. Sure, so the question uh, um, about um, technology and the, the you, you classified a, a low uh, versus, and then the assumption is there's a high. Mm -hmm. And I think about this a lot because I have conversations around those themes because someone might say, well, are you working with a low technology or high, you're working with a low technology and a high technology simultaneously. It's my belief that the high technology I'm working with is actually the earth. Because as I mentioned, humans have been developing that material and that technology. I think earth can be thought of as both. It's both a material and a technology for 10,000 years at least, 30,000 if we think about ceramics. Um, the low technology is that which is more recent. It's the printer itself that's super low tech. It's dumb, it breaks down a lot. We understand the performance and the quality and the sophistication of the earth, and we're just figuring out that relationship between machines and how they, um, tr how they are the medium that transforms the earth in a different way. So that's sort of what, what, I'm, what I'm thinking about when I think about this, this conversation about low tech and high tech. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's a, I think it's a great a great framing for talking about everything that 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 we've seen. Um, I had on a slide I didn't make a reference to it, the idea of appropriate technology, which is a real 1970s throwback, maybe 60s, but incredibly useful. Which is the idea that technology is not. A teleology. It doesn't, it's not a straightforward march to ever higher stages, but that there's moments and places and situations 
in which different kinds of technologies, and you know, my students are always horrified when I tell them that a book is a technology, mm -hmm. but it is in the uh -huh. same way that you said Earth is a technology. So I think is really fascinating here, and what you know struck me so much, looking especially at the post-war examples, was the way in which I mean, Germany had the most highly developed building industry probably in the world mm -hmm. before the war and during the war. The same, you know people who were fabricating those fabulous window hardwares that allowed Mies van der Rohe to sink windows into the ground of a Studenthot villa were designing enormous hinges so that Albert Speer could have 15 foot doors, right? Mm -hmm. There's total continuity there. You get to the post-war period and they're confronted with this completely different situation in which technology needs to be applied to extremely dire circumstances at a moment of ethical and moral soul searching. And to find earth at that junction, to me, seems like something meaningful, mm -hmm. right? Okay, well, I, I um, you know, as, as a pra practitioner in this industry, uh, I liken the, the creation of a mixed design to where the concrete industry was in its early, early days of, what is our strength, um, compressive strength requirements? What are the you know modules for rupture? What kind of what kind of performance are we trying to get out of this material known as concrete? And they were trying to put together mixed different mixed designs, again based on location um, of what they had available. So that's what you know we are trying to do uh, with this now clay and sand and and other additives of, as we've um, explored. And what are the performance criteria that we're trying to get out of that? So we are an unfired masonry material at, um, at, you know, at its um, core, and we are trying to meet certain standards that are prescribed. And there are earth building codes, and those uh, are being improved upon. And there are ASTM standards for this material. But I think that's where I see the kind of this low tech um, material. But it's really. Um, having a place in the building code as as a kind of natural concrete, let's say. Uh, yeah, um, some really good points. Uh, I, you know, it's 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 an interesting question. Um, I think we we should all always first remember that. Um, I mean, Deleuze famously wrote that all technology is social before it's technical, mm -hmm. right? And I think sometimes we we forget that when we we get. I think at the end of my my slides, I made a reference to you know we, I think we're always pushed up against. Well, can you do it? Can you do it faster? Can you do it more efficient? Right? And this is, you know, I constantly hear this on on projects, and uh, it's not that it's wrong, right? But it's it's we're downstream of culture as as designers and makers, and so I think we often, um, if we can use our design skills and and the materials that we're using to push back um, to to swim upstream, we can. We can have an impact, you know. I I think we uh, we're having this moment where we're questioning technology today. You know, is can it be good? It can it be bad? And I, you know, it's happening not just with architecture, but with everything going on right now. And um, uh, Lewis Mumford wrote, you know, technology isn't separate, right? It can't promise well or ill. It only promises well or ill as the social groups who use them promise well or ill. And mm -hmm. I think we just we need to remember that when we when we make things. There's kind of a cosmic connection or, or, or an, an interesting synchronicity of, of um, so many of us talking about the perceptual barrier and showing that I bet the Smith, if, the Smith, if, if only the Smithsonian would have known, they would piss off Earth people so, so much like that. Um, but um, really a question of how do we then deal with that perceptual barrier? And that's linking to that question maybe on low tech for for um each of your perspectives um be, because there's also a, um um a multiscalar um perhaps applicability of earth from art practice to speculative design small scale installation to mainstream construction that each of us are tackling um from a different angle and and only hearing your answers is so illuminating from, from the different views that you're uh, suggesting. So maybe I'm, I'm really curious to hear from you, how do you suggest the, the, the future actions or future um, um, directions we should take to overcome the perceptual barrier? Should we overcome the perceptual barrier? 
and then um, more or less, what is what is the future of Earth construction in this multiscalar um, possibilities? Do you want us to give the same thing? Again? Let's go back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, well, you you've done the survey on this, so mm -hmm. you have you have all the data. Um, yeah, the perceptual. Um, uh, problem, if we can call it that, is is interesting. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, I'd be lying if I said I had an answer to it. Um, I think it's everything, everywhere, all at once, right? Like we, you know, we need to be uh, engaging uh, our, ourselves, right? Where there's a lot of lack of understanding within our disciplines, with, you know, internally, but also adjacent uh, disciplines and professions, I think we, um, we need to engage as well. Um, yeah, I think, and, and just more examples of people seeing it, because I, I think I've seen people's opinion change after they, they see it in person, right? Um, what do they see? And I think that's where uh, designers uh, actually have re more relevancy here, because, you know, good design, you know, design can, can illuminate something that we, we previously you know, took for granted or didn't think was possible, so... Yeah, I, I, both you and Lisa, I heard you um, describing um, demonstration or, or, or demo structure that could showcase the construction system, uh, something that is really critically needed. Maybe, Lisa, if you want to um, yeah. share about your vision for, for <laughs> uh, the demo you, you want to include in, in yeah. the facility you uh, like a direct. Like a show home type of uh, show, showcase um, structure. I mean, you know, if I had answers to this question, I probably wouldn't be <laughs> um, struggling in, in working in, in this way, in this industry as much. But I have explored, obviously, this, this um, question. And another survey result I've seen on this topic is that an organization, if there's an organization that's supporting and um, dis dispensing information and resources are around this to a location that really greatly, you know, um, in, involves the trust or from the public. But um, I think walking them in the doors is a great example and, and having people push on the walls and making, you know, see how they, how they feel and being in the acoustics and the feeling of it. I, I know my first night sleeping in an earthen home, um, in New Zealand, I, I remember uh, laying there and thinking, this is the best camping trip ever. <laughs> and um, to me, it was just this feeling of being enveloped and super protected in these walls. And that's not a feeling you can, um, you know, share with others without maybe experiencing it yourself. So, again, if I had, if I had, uh, I explore a lot of reasons, and I think it's, I'm holding events like this. I'm so glad you guys are all here to, to um, explore this with us together. So, um, I, you know, I my impulse would be to act, ask back whose perception are we talking about here? Because, um, you know, there's a, 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 a band encircling the globe of region. It's, it's almost like a meridian. And in that meridian, the majority of people are living in earthen structures, mm -hmm. right? What is their perception of them? And, you know, for whom are we building? Do we, I, you know, it's like, are we, as architects, of course we build for the 1% because that's the way our profession is set up. But earthen building is a material that serves a whole, a whole spectrum of different uses. And what I, you know, when I was doing the, just at Earth Kit, there was really interesting research coming out of Peru. Peru is one of those areas of the world that has quite a bit of earth and building that is also earthquake prone. Yeah. We see that, you know, every time there is an earthquake in Pakistan, there are similar, in Turkey, there were similar outcomes. And the way to treat adobe so that loss of life is enormously reduced is so simple. And what they did in Peru was to wrap buildings in chicken wire and take nails and drive nails through bottle caps to hold the chicken wire in place. Mm -hmm. And that exterior reinforcing kept the buildings from collapsing. They fractured, but it saved lives. Mm -hmm. So if I had my druthers, like whose perception would I change? I would change the perception of the people 
who are living in Adobe, not by choice, but of necessity, who have every right to the benefits of the buildings, but also have every right to safety and you know not, not just life safety, but also to um, you know a sense of understanding their place in in a in a deep tradition that we're here in New York praising. And if I had if I had the answer to that, then I'd probably be a much more important person than I am. But. <laughs> I just realized the problem with going last is I been thinking about all these <laughs> amazing answers and I don't know what to say. Other, <clears throat> I, I often tell my students that um, like industrial design is really technologically complex, um, but architecture is really culturally complex. It's not so technologically complex. It's pretty simple, in my opinion, um, to make the wall, to make a floor. But its cultural complexity is what is really um, what makes design of architecture really challenging. And so it depends on, on the culture and who, you know, what cultures we are responding to when we design and when we design with earth. And so, you know, I, I, I've thought about how earth spans the globe and how it spans the globe. Like Ronald Reagan's home was made out of Adobe. Chairman Mao's home was made out of Adobe. The oldest house in Boston, which is Paul Revere's house, was made out of Adobe. And so it's, it spans this cultural uh, landscape of the planet, but it's responding in very different ways, um, depending on who's living there. And I think that it is the responsibility of designers today to, to think about how Earth can continue in a contemporary context for those who live within that contemporary context, right? If you're living in 2023 in Africa, you probably don't want an Adobe building because you think that it represents poverty. Um, and then someone from like, you know, might go and say, well, you, what you do, what you're losing this great cultural asset. And so it becomes evangelical in a way, like you just, well, I keep doing it, but there's a cultural response to that that says, no, this is actually detrimental to our culture if we build in earth. And so I think designers have to demonstrate how it can be responsive. I haven't done a good job of that. I'm squirting out mud that I get lots of comments, you know, and it looks like poop. And for me, it looks like home. But for a lot of people, like, they're not going to want to live in something that looks like that. So it's my responsibility as a designer to demonstrate that maybe the technology can help transform that. And that's something I have to work on, but I think it's something all designers have to work on is to think about how this material can be responsive, as you say, to the, the cultures that designers are designing for. Yeah, I completely agree with that. In, in a sense, um, because we're, we're talking um, a lot about uh, approaching perception maybe for, for designers, and, and since the audience does include probably um, a nice perception of design and architectural students, Maybe another question or another thing that I'm constantly thinking is how in architectural education or building profession education or even in vocational training, we can introduce earth as a building material as a, uh, for its uh, area of, of applications, 3D printing, compressed earth, round earth, Adobe, um, et cetera. Um, and maybe uh, before we... Um, open to um, questions from the audience, maybe um, if, if you'd like to say a word or two of how do you think or how do you approach um, earth construction in education? How do you approach the agency of MUD um, in education for not only for architecture, but uh, for, for the area of building professionals you might be uh, uh, engaging with? I work with a lot of building inspectors and officials that are um, looking at set of plans to uh, um, give a permit. And so uh, for that, I've put together, compiled um, inf a cover letter appendices uh, directing them to where this is done in other places. And that's typically what gives us a lot of confidence as where has this been done well before. Um, I direct them to earth building codes around the world of which there are maybe 50 countries plus probably that have their own earth building code. Um, states, counties have even starting to adopt these. So that's where I um, 
start and I give the, 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 in, the engineering, the material, the compressor strength, the laboratory results. Um, and, and really, once we start, I'm actually, I educate my clients even as to how to talk about this material to their, to their builders and to their um, building officials that this is a low embodied carbon masonry block and we don't have to um, complicate it any further. <laughs> and, and this is a structural block that's reinforced. Um, most often where we have uh, horizontal or, rein or vertical reinforcing needs. So I, I like to just to simplify it and, um, and you know, buildings that have been built without any reinforcing or a bond beam or without any engineering principles, unfortunately have, um, have given this product a bad reputation. And so I think that's where a simple chicken wire contains the material, right? And, and it contains this heavy and brittle material, but we can do this um, again, my background in New Zealand, which is very wet and seismic, there's a three three book three books on the earth building codes of this material. Each book is about 110 pages long or so. So um, a lot of work has been done in this, and we can just keep continuing to inform others and educate in that way. Um, yeah. So the, I mean, the question about education and and how to that's what. Right. And, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I, I clearly showed a, an example of, of building with students and, but it's, it's incredibly, um, you're up against a lot, right? I mean, it's, it's not a, a, an easy thing, right? Building with earth can be uh, hard and slow. Um, but I think when, when there's a moment where you, you see students where they're, where they're um, engaging with it for the first time and there's something different about it uh it, it's it, despite the fact that it can be hard and so i mean we were we were we, we also did this in july so we were exhausted uh, the entire time um but uh there's something happens and it, there's something there's a, com a sense of community that's embedded in it and I, I really do think that we can we can bring these methods uh into the 21st century in in very interesting ways um and and the things as I as I mentioned about you know things like erosion and all all the kind of you know, perceptual you know challenges you have to overcome and you can actually reframe those to to be um, to be seen as as assets not as liabilities um, and and I, I think I think that's where the challenge in education lies is getting getting more people exposed to it um, and uh, yeah I I think. Um, to to kind of, to sum it up, I I I'm remembering a, a quote from uh, Ivan Illich in Energy and Equity when he says participatory democracy demands low energy technology, and the the path to social to productive social relations should be traveled at the speed of a bicycle. So I think the 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 kind of slow hard road is is the one to travel. So for for me, uh, education is fundamental to earth and construction. It's something that traditionally is actually passed down from generation to generation. So that's inherent in it. It's a cultural material. Again, it's a cultural technology. And I think in that passing down of knowledge, um, there's also the, the acquisition of knowledge, right? When it, when it moves into new contexts, when, when we move into new times. Um, but these, these feelings that we, we describe as feelings, you being in this space and you feel it or you touch it and you feel it, to me is also about our relationship, our, our genetic relationship to earth. And this might sound kooky, but what I mean by that is that we actually look the way we do and we move around the way we do is because we evolved to manipulate the material. We, we, we are, designed, in fact, to engage with the earth. And probably for the last 150 years, we haven't. And so when we do, when we are in a building made of earth, we feel it. When we grab a handful of mud, it makes sense to us, but we don't know why. But I think that's why. And we have to actually educate ourselves to recognize that relationship we have to earth. And that might be one of the ways we overcome those perceptions as well. That's so true. Yeah. Um, so I'm 
don't know that I have that much to add. I do think um, I no longer teach architects. I teach future clients of architecture. Maybe that's my, my service to the profession. But the two things that I would just want to add are these ideas of service learning and um, the importance of investing in labor as a student of architecture of any building industry. Um, my experience as an architect is that the value of labor is set too low. Generally, we talk about unskilled or semi-skilled labor, but I dare any white collar worker to go out and miter a corner, right? And I think earth construction is one that is, is, is one version of that that's particularly revelatory because it seems so easy and it is so hard. I know you and I and Zena, who's in the audience are working on a project and the nightmare of plastering, which seems, you know, like what could be so hard about plastering? It's like icing a cake, but it, it, it requires, as you said, so much embodied knowledge, so much, um, uh, sort of tactile skill. Um, and in that sense, I would imagine that, especially for students of architecture, it's not just going to the wood shop or the fab lab, but actually engaging something that is deceptively complex is of particular value. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Um, and also a sense that when when you do go back to working with earth, there's a sense of warming up or or becoming again familiar with the material until you right you um, you um, um, see again the the grains the the particles the 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 corners the shape and um, yeah. I'm just I'm just it. gonna add so when I was in architecture school I had a friend who used to come and break my pencil points because I like to draw in two H and four H lead <laughs> and he'd be like enough small lines and I remember you going. Lynette, this is not about precision. So I think that that's an object <laughs> lesson for every architect, mm -hmm. right? I think this is a wonderful moment maybe to open to questions. Um. Uh, hi, thanks everyone. Uh, I feel like I have so many questions for each of you. <laughs> um, but I guess generally talking about the perception barrier, but on the kind of opposite side of it, the celebration of the material, it kind of like it presents itself to us as a new material. It you know it doesn't act like cement. It's not it's it's not poured or maybe it's rammed or maybe it, like we engage with it in a different way. It's constructed in a different way. Um, it has different chemical makeups from all the other materials that we engage with in the building industry right now. Um, and I'm just curious, like, how do we push the material and in further engage with it? Um, like, can we celebrate it from a design perspective? Like, is it is it telling us it's different? Like, should we be representing it differently? Like, should we not be drawing lines, like two lines as a, you know, an edge of the wall, but rather a, you know, a dynamic texture? Um, but then in the, in the other direction, um, with ASTM standards and kind of engaging with, um, convention and current, I guess, construction methods and I guess policy at a whole, um, where does the future of pushing the material um, lie in between these like drastic, like, um, you know, crazy, like new, new, new material, but also like, it's just a brick, don't worry. Um, I think it's a really interesting um, question to ask where like where we can play into the the newness of the material. That's a great question. Um, I can share some of my perspective from my teachers, who are mainly uh, um, builders, who 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 taught me to work with earth materials without drawing at all, and actually discouraged any drawings whatsoever. Uh, but just working with a, a, a model of the earth. Or what clay, clay storming, I think, Anna Heringer also coins it clay storming, where you work with a material or a replica of the material, like clay, and you create a smaller scale, or or you work in on, on the site to 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 place the, the material. Um, I'm not sure it's it's very 
I'm not sure it's be, if it's because of this small scale, the inherent small scaleness of earth construction, and how is it dictated by the material by the materiality itself. But this is what I've been observing, and therefore also somewhat practicing in my experimental um, practice in lab, um, which is an interesting change. If we're going to see more of this material that we need to draw lines on paper and we need to do calculations right. for, um, you know, for its properties and, and design, I think where the material really sings and where my heart sings when is when I see these walls go up and when I see these these walls being um, plastered and finished. It's a, it's a beauty. It's a real, it's a real glorious beauty to the, um, to the materiality um, being built and, and these, these homes being finished and these lives being carried out in them. So I think that's where, that's where the art is, is in the finish. And, and, and we've talked about the process too. There is something very, um, the tangible, feeling of what working with this material there's something very kind of we get ubi groovy yes together but um, there's something very soul connecting to it it feels mm -hmm. great so i'm gonna throw something out that i think it depends on how one draws i never draw my details um in any kind of digital program, because it's always really important to me that I understand the pieces of which something is made. So rather than drawing a wall or a window as a series of unbroken lines, I will draw all the constituent parts like you saw in the Hilger drawings. And I think that that might be a clue to how to draw this material, to understand how it makes it, its boundaries, how it makes its proximities, how different um, margins of error interact and reverberate through construction because no building is 100% any one material. So I would gesture to that as a different way to think about drawing with Adobe. I just want to talk about drawing with mud because it's something that um, I think about a lot and I think it was influenced by a project I did maybe in my junior year in undergrad where my, my art precedent for the architecture was Paul Clay, who said something about taking a line for a walk. And the, the, the software that I developed it was called Potterware that was, did a lot of these early ceramic prints was actually taking a line for a walk. And so rather than draw a representation of a wall, I have to think about how you design the curve that moves through the entire building. And that's been really exciting for me to think about just that line of mud and how you can imagine it meeting and interfacing with windows or passing over lintels or becoming a stair or creating um, space for uh, insulation or uh, making it thicker where you need more structure and thinner. And so that for me has been a, a real, Beautiful way for me, at least. That's that's probably one of the most exciting things for me about thinking about that relationship between drawing and building, mm -hmm. and that now it's just a continuous thread that moves through a, a, a potential future architecture. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about the economics of the material and the industry that builds it and labor, yeah, maybe comparatively with other sorts of other technologies. Mm. <laughs> <We're all> I can, <laughs> <laughs> um, we are very similar. It, obviously the labor market is very regional. So um, a house built in, in Vail or Aspen in Colorado is a thousand dollars a square foot versus um, Denver's around 250. I'm just kind of giving some really ballpark prices on cost of construction. Um, the cost of the walls are typically only around 20% the cost of the total structure. Um, we are very similar to other load bearing masonry wall systems. Um, we are typically more expensive than a timber frame construction home, but we're getting a, a very different end product. So, you know, talking to a client about that that uh, about cost, if they, if they want a cheaper home, then they were probably uh, commercially built not the best option, unless you're gonna make your own bricks and lay your own walls and bring, you know, be, be part of that labor um, process. So, but what you are getting is a, 
you know, a higher performing home, a fireproof home, a more thermal mass and higher um, resistant home and, and operational energy as well as embodied energy and all these other kind of oofy groovy thing, good things that we've been talking about. So that's my perception, at least in where I'm, where I'm building. Lisa, I'm curious. No, no, thanks. Maybe just a follow-up question is, what could drive costs less? Or in other question, or other words, uh, we talked about how for an installation in Paris that Lynette and I are working, mm -hmm. we found three earth construction or earth lock um, manufacturers around Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously there is demand and, and they are able to... So, so how, what drives costs in your um, uh, plant mm -hmm. and how... In, in an ideal world, or what would you shorten in terms of intermediate storage or transportation, or what what is the stream of supply chain that uh, dictates uh, cost most, mostly in your um, product? It's production and the efficiency around um, production, and of course, driving demand also will reduce the overall cost um, if the higher the higher the demand but it's the equipment used to make these these materials or these blocks are not um, high tech they, but there is a obviously a cost associated so I think you know being set up next to the to the lo location of the material the raw material um, and then the labor market and the labor behind that but it's I think driving efficiencies and processes, so that um, you know machines aren't breaking down, or that you don't need to buy another skid steer. Or, um, but in terms of the cost of the overall structure, it's the finishes. Those, those finishes is what you know. What type? It's I kind of like asking, well, how much does a car cost? Um, well, what kind of car <laughs> are we talking about? It's it's similar for a building. What kind of finishes and performance are we looking at of it? I, I was just going to add. Um, about our relationship as designers to homogenous materials, because that's what we're used to. We're the same concrete here, the same concrete in China, the same concrete in Africa, same with steel, same with glass, even wood. Uh, but earth has never done very well of entering into the context of capitalism because it's very difficult to homogenize. And yet earth, um, is a technology that can be used to make buildings in all of its heterogeneity, in all of its complexity. Uh, the, the, the addition of sand or clay particles or silt. And so that makes it difficult to homogenize and that makes it difficult to capitalize upon it. And so the, the modern project is really about finding those standards and measures that allow us to use, use it. And that's why I, th I think that makes it challenging, that makes it more expensive, right? Because there's not a standardization of it. And I think you're, you're experiencing, and, and maybe attempting to, standardize in a lot of ways that material to bring it into the context of selling blocks and making houses. And, and so that's, that's another maybe perceptual challenge or an actual economic challenge. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect is the labor, you know, and, and all designers experience this, right? If you want to do something different, you say, well, if we just do acrylic and it's just one screw into the material rather than painting and screwing and taping and all this, but just screwing one screw into acrylic is going to cost more because they're going to say, well, we don't really do that. We don't want, you know? And so it becomes challenging. And that's what face, that's one problem with Earth. Um, when one conversation that comes up with robots is that, oh, you're removing labor from the equation and labor is needed. Um, especially because it's seen as something that responds to areas of the planet where there's a lot of labor. Uh, and so removing labor from the equ equation is part of it. I think there's a lot of benefits to that, which is that people don't wake up in the morning and start tilling earth anymore and building blocks. And there's a saying that we have in Spanish, like, while you rest, um, make some adobes. Okay. And, and uh, I don't think people do that anymore because they get up and go to the bank and work there or go to work in a school or wherever they work. And when they rest, they're resting. They're not making adobes and because they don't need to. And so they, they're making money to pay someone to repaint their house or redo their roof, not to learn these techniques. And so the, the robot potentially removes that from the equation. Is that problematic? I, I'd like to think, and I'm optimistic about this, 
that it allows the reintroduction of Earth into contemporary construction practices because it serves as the vehicle to allow for that to happen. I don't know if it's true, that's what my hope is, but... I would yeah. also argue that in still in digital production, there's a lot of manual labor too, so, so it's... Yeah. And there is. There's and there, a, a, yeah. a collaborative agency between mm -hmm. between both. My elbow still hurts after <laughs> that uh, one project, but there's also a lot of intellectual labor that yeah. goes into it as well. And I think there's a new form. And I think it might be really interesting to think about education that you can bring uh, new types of technologies to new audiences that maybe haven't had access to those technologies before. You know. One last, <clears throat> sorry, one last quick question or two very, th two quick questions. <laughs> I don't know if it, is it okay? I have a two part question. So a two part <laughs> question and a, another question. Okay, thanks. Um, so two questions unrelated, but super important. I think the first question is about circularity. Um, I really loved the archival research that was done and the, the notion of unearthing knowledges that have been ancient and historical of the lands that you're all working with. And I would just love to hear more about how you're thinking about the circularity of the material, how you're thinking about where the material is coming from, your relationship to it, and also how you're replenishing the lands in which the soil is coming from. Um, and then my second question is about weather and the relationship between the materials that you're working with, the final built form works that you guys are creating, and its relationship to kind of the changing dynamic weather that it experiences in its external stimuli conditions. I know that there was one mechanism to control erosion, and I would just love to hear some other practical applications of how you're thinking about this um, building construction style to... Uh, the context of the world that we live in and, and the weather scene. Did you want to do two questions? Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. Remember the questions. <laughs> yeah, mine is a bit long as well, but um, well, you've mentioned that there's no standardized rammed earth, um, and I'm kind of curious about whether there could ever be an EPD analysis for specific rammed earth recipes that you found work really well over and over again to the point where you know this one recipe works in cold climates, um, this other recipe works for another climate or another specific purpose, and what that process might look like to come up with an EPD analysis, since it seems like something that um, those looking for ecological materials would be looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, Wholesome, a German firm, came out with an EPD um, analysis for their selection of concrete products, and that's kind of where the question is stemming from. Uh, two and a half or three really, really fantastic <laughs> questions. Maybe for the EPD, Lisa, and then yeah, for, for the circularity, all of us can. I, yeah, can I think we can relate. all ch chime in. So, um, a life cycle assessment and LCA is uh, the calculator. What we use to um, determine what how much energy it goes into making something. And so, if we're talking about rammed earth, and I'm you know doing a LCA for the blocks that I'm making, so calculating how much fuel is going into the machine, how many bags of lime are going into the, the blocks. Um, which gives you an EPD, which is an environmental product declaration. This is a nutrition label, basically, for, for a product um, of, of how, how it stands in greenhouse gas emissions and carbon, carbon um, footprints. So an EPD would be for, my understanding would be for the product, the end product of, um, say, a mix, and it would, have to, it would have to be unique if that mix were to change. Uh, so where is that sand raw raw material coming from and uh, what machinery is being used to install. So it, and a life cycle assessment typically is a, um, back to circularity, a little bit of a cradle to gate or cradle to grave or kind of a basic stages of, of that material. So um, I'm looking at a cradle to gate for the, for the um, blocks. Um, so it leaves out the embodied, the operational energy or that end of life cycle as it returns. Back. So circularity, I'll 
I'll maybe let others chime in on that. I, I would love to speak to the question of the LCAs, et cetera, because the field that I work in is really LCA dependent. And the idea behind LCAs, let's be clear, is to create something like monetary system to compare things. And the way that money works is to say these things are equal because we have this abstract system that makes them equal. And LCA does the same thing. And LCA is not an accurate representation of what actually is going into the product. And discrepancies, difference is ruled, is, is eliminated from the LCA process. And many LCAs, for example, don't include transportation. Um, because they can't, because supply chain is variable. If you get an LCA for plywood, and your plywood in one week could be coming from Canada, and another week it could be coming from the Western United States, and another week it could be coming from Finland. Those have radically different energy, embodied energy implications. LCA will not tell you that. So whatever the labels are, you need to understand the parameters through which they're generated. Otherwise, they're, they're, they're not very helpful. And there's a similar problem with the question of circularity because the time frame in which circularity could occur is so variable. So you can talk about potential return. You could talk about potential circularity. What is so interesting about earthen construction is its, 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 its indebted or its, its relationship to its location. Right. One of the problems, you know, I, I hear a lot of talk about a circular economy, but if you're shipping recyclable plastics to a different country in order to make them into new product, that is not circular. That's global supply chain in a different form. True circularity has to have locational proximity and earth has that potential. So, and that maybe also goes back to the other question you were asking about weathering, right? There's a kind of match, let's say, or appropriateness between place and material when material comes from place, right? And maybe that's another way to think about it. Um, yeah, both, both great questions. Um, to, to get back to the, the question about circularity, which I do think is an in, incredibly uh, interesting, important, but difficult conversation to have today. Um, you know, I, I think the best way to, I could sum it, there's a beautiful poem by T.S. Eliot called East Coker, and the first line of the poem is, in my beginning is my end. And I think that's, that's at the heart of this, is a recognition that when we make something, it it will pass, it will go away. Um, I think we have, you know, and it, it ties in the conversation about LCA, right? We have this strange language that we use around buildings, end of life, waste, right? Um, when all of life on earth exists because of waste from the sun. We have a strange relationship with the idea of, of waste and, and end of life in, in architecture, um, especially because no, there's no such thing as a permanent building, right? It doesn't exist. And so I think, there's numerous strategies to, you know, you, you asked about the erosion question. There's numerous technical strategies we have towards uh, handling the erosion of, of raw earth and buildings. I showed you one in my talk, um, but that can be done with numerous other techniques that are, uh, that are already established. Um, bamboo can be used. Um, and how many countless more that we fi might find out together, right, through future design projects. But I think the most important part about circularity is it's not a technical one. I, I remember very clearly um, having dinner with Martin Rao one night, and we were talking about this very topic, and he said that the main challenge towards erosion and towards circularity is, is not a technical one, it's a cultural one. And I, and I think we have to recognize that and work towards that. Yeah, maybe um, one small thing I want to relate to the question on the uh, EPDs. Um, or, or, or you, you tell me with your signs, Rafi. When, oh, we're, we're done. Okay. So maybe to, just to wrap up is um, really the importance of um, using earth construction to be able to be nutritious back to the land and, and, and encapsulating that in EPDs is extremely important. Um, from a research perspective, because for instance, softwares like um, amazing softwares like Tali, et cetera, are increasingly relying on databases of EPDs and those databases still do not include natural 
um, um, alternative, maybe building materials, including earth construction. So from a research standpoint, we need to work across um, disciplines with material manufacturers, for instance, to um, study the LCA encapsulate it in, in a kind of formal ISO standardized e uh, EPD, um, and maybe to uh, uh, reflect for a second about our discussion and how we started from the materiality to the from the perception, but also um, move through aspects of circularity and, and policy, I think, is really at the heart of uh, earth construction in the past couple of decades. And um, maybe with this, we can wrap, right? We're out of time. Yes. Thank you, Thank you so much.